Yeah, hi. Um, so first of all, I want to apologize for the, for the squaring in the title. Um, there was kind of like an internal name that we used, and someone on my team said, wouldn't it be funny if you get the talk accepted with this in the, t in the title? So uh, I, le I left it in. But um, So I'm going to talk about um, something that we call shitless-driven development, and I'm um, going to share some tricks about um, about how to work with, with really, really large uh, code bases. And um, it's not going to be too Ruby-specific, but um, I think no matter which language you uh, you work with, hopefully you can find something useful. Um, yeah, so for, for a little bit of context, um, I work for Shopify, which is a, a e-commerce um, software as a service platform um, uh, headquartered in Canada. And we are, as far as I know, one of the oldest and I think the largest Ruby on Rails code bases in the world. Um, we've been using Rails since version 0. Point something, like over 10 years ago. Um, and I think it's probably the biggest Ruby company in Canada. Um, this is uh, Ottawa, the capital of Canada, and it's one of the buildings on the on the right is uh, the Shopify headquarter. And um, <laughs> my my job at Shopify is um, I I basically work on one of the core architecture teams, and a lot of my job looks like this. So I I do a lot of very broad work, very low level changes, lots of maintenance work, and um, lots of work that affects the entire application, the entire platform, and um, most of the um, most of the Take tips and um, stuff that in this in this talk is um, coming from that context a little bit. So um, Shopify is a is a monolithic Rails application. Um, that doesn't mean that the the tips that I'm giving here can't be applied to like other code bases. But just so you know, this is where um, where this comes from. But um, so we we um, we run a multi-tenant architecture, which means that we we host people's um, online stores and we have about more than 400,000 of those online stores, and they're all running in the same application, the same database, the same, the same deployment. Um, so it's not like multiple. It's not like each shop has its own deployment, but it's all the same application. Um, and we do uh, we do about 20 to 40,000 uh, requests per second, and our main GitHub repository has about 800 contributors, um, which includes developers, designers, and um, content strategists and documentation writers, all, all that kind of stuff. And um, there's a whole bunch of problems that comes with you have so many people trying to change the same thing at um, at the same time and so quickly. And so for all of those 800 contributors have um, have permission to merge changes to master. Uh, they all have um, permission to, to deploy to production. And um, we, with the rate of change that we have right now, we deploy about 50 times per day. And those 50 deploys are about 100 PR, 50 to 100 PRs a day. And um, so yeah, the, that kind of um, amount of change every day gives you a bunch of interesting problems that um, you don't really run into with smaller applications. But um, yeah, it's it's a it's a it's a challenge. So um, I want to phrase this talk as um, from the perspective of productivity problems. So I'm going to I'm going to talk about three. Um, Three important productivity problems that were um, that we were faced with, and um, share some tips about how we um, how we uh, worked on them. So the first one is deploys. So um, if you have this many people working on the same code and the same application, and uh, they all want to deploy, the deploys actually become a bottleneck. And um, what I mean by that is, um, first of all. If you hire more people, they want to ship more code, and shipping more code means that you either need to deploy more often or you need to have bigger deploys. So one of the two. And um, for for several reasons, smaller deploys are often better. So um, a few obvious ones is that that fewer changes are often easier to um, to debug. It's safer. You're changing less code at the same time. It's easier to to roll back. It's easier to um, to revert and um, easier to keep an overview of what's happening. So from, from that perspective, we, we wanted small deploys and not bigger ones. So now um, an important observation is that if you want small deploys and you want to deploy often, you need, to, you need, you need your deploys f uh, to be fast. So um, as an example, I said we deploy about 50 times per day. Um, most of our developers are in the same time zone, so that means about six deploys per business hour. And if those deploys take longer than 10 minutes, then they become a serious productivity problem for us because we can't ship the code as fast as we want to. And that means we can't, you know, can't develop features as quickly as we want to. So 
so um, what do we what do we uh, do about this? Um, so first of all, when I say when I say deploy, I don't I don't only mean um, getting the code into production, but I mean the entire um, pipeline that comes with that. So building um, if you use Docker, um, for example, building a CI container, running running your tests on CI, um, building the production container, uploading the production container to um, wherever you have to upload it to, like get it on the server, restart all of those containers, make sure everything is uh, successful. So when I say deploy, I really mean this entire um, sequence of steps. Um, so an obvious one is if you have um, CI builds, you should parallelize them. So if you have two people who want to ship something at the same time, you shouldn't run the CI builds one after another. But also if the same person has multiple tests, you can easily run the tests um, in parallel. So that one is pretty obvious. Um, Another one that is that was super helpful for us is that you should build those um, containers in advance. So um, before I said we have about um, 50 deploys, but about 100 PRs. That means some deploys contain more than one PR. Um, so if we build um, those production containers for every merge to master, that means we build a lot of containers that actually never get deployed. But the huge advantage of that is that um, if that container wants, to, if someone wants to deploy that container, then it is already uh, ready, and we don't have to build it in that moment. Um, another really big improvement that we had is um, during the container builds, um, we would often, uh, often um, invoke different rake tasks and so on, and each of those rake tasks would often boot the Rails application. And if you, if your Rails application is this big, booting just just running a rake task, ju just booting um, loading the Rails environment before you can even start doing start running your Rails task, uh, rake task often takes up to 10 seconds or so. So um, finding a way to combine all of those and um, so you only have to boot it once was a huge speed up for us. Uh, yeah, deploy to many servers in parallel. That's obvious. Um, you don't want to do one server at a time if you have an application of this size. Um, and now if you um, if you look at all those different steps, so building containers, running tests, building the production container, um, restarting the applications, all of those require booting the application. So if you find a way to reduce the time it takes to boot your application, that has a huge impact in, different, um, in, in many different areas. So that, that was a really big improvement. Um, and then the last one that is often a little bit overlooked is um, how long does it take to shut down your application? So Especially if you're running a, um, a web application um, and you're using Unicorn, there's a standard timeout value that um, says how long is a request allowed to run. And if you want to deploy, you have to, you either have to terminate those requests, which is going to lead to errors, or you have to wait for them to finish. And if you wait for them to finish, that means your deploy is going to take at least as long as it takes for that to happen. So um, doing whatever you can to make sure um, you have as little long running requests as possible is going to have a huge impact on um, the speed at which you can deploy. Um, the other bottleneck related to deploys are humans. So there's a couple of steps that um, you can totally get away with at a smaller company or a smaller code base, a smaller project. But if you want to deploy 100 times a day, then um, that's not going to work anymore. So um, one example is Smaller companies often have an ops team, and those, that ops team is allowed to deploy. Um, but if you have 800 people and they all want to deploy, um, if all of them have to ask the ops team to deploy, that doesn't work. So um, you need to allow people to deploy on their own. So um, another thing, asking, having someone that decides now is a good time to deploy doesn't scale. Um, asking every, everyone to pay attention to the status of master CI doesn't scale. Um, asking everyone to pay attention to errors during a deploy. So Having everyone watch the deploy to see was it okay, that doesn't scale if you have this many people. And at the end, even even asking, even even saying, hey, every developer can deploy themselves, even that doesn't scale at the point. Um, so in summary, humans don't scale. Um, and you should automate this process as much as you can. Um, so to, to illustrate, I want to show you um, the tool that we use, but there's nothing really special about this tool. You can easily write your own. Like the, the point that I'm trying to make is that you should have some kind of tool, and that tool should not be a human, it should be a, a software. Um, so this is our um, deploy software, it's called ShipIt, it's open source if you want you You can use it or you can steal some ideas and write your own, but um, a few important parts here is that um, here, for example, you can see it's waiting for CI, and um, as soon as those tests are passing, um, we automatically deploy this, and um, there's no human that has to press a button or nobody has to 
um, say it's okay to deploy now. So um, basically we expect people, um, if they merge to master, that basically means this is good to de get deployed. Um, another big one that um, we often have is that um, people make mistakes, so you merge something and then um, you, so you, you figure out, oh, something was wrong, I need to revert it. And then we often had problems where um, people had to manually keep an eye on, oh shit, this can't get deployed, so revert it, then lock the deploys, make sure the first one doesn't go out without the second one, and so on. So um, automating this in software is really, was really um, taking away some of the human uh, interaction from this process for us. So this feature, for example, here says, if there's a revert uh, for a commit that hasn't been deployed yet, then nothing in that range can get deployed. And then if something passes CI after that, it's gonna get deployed automatically. Um, another thing that you can automate is um, telling people that their code is now being deployed. So um, if, you, if you deploy stuff automatically, um, it's still important that people know that their changes are going out. So we have, um, we have a Slack channel with, um, where, you can, where people get notifications um, to see that their code is going out and um, um, another, another important thing is that um, we, don't, we don't want people to merge too many commits into master, so we don't, we, we don't want the commits to pile up. So if there's a, there's a, um, a large backlog of stuff that hasn't been deployed yet, we want people to wait. And so on a smaller application, it's okay if someone keeps an eye on that and then pokes the people and say, hey, don't do this. But if you have, if you have a lot of people and if the application gets really big, then um, this kind of like, um, Educating people is also something that you can automate. So in our case, if someone does this, if someone merges um, to master while CI is failing or while there's a lot of commits that haven't been deployed yet, those people also get, get a notification saying um, you shouldn't do that. Um, this one is really interesting, I thought, because um, it's a little walk around about, um, uh, or like, yeah, it's a, it's, I would say it's a walk around for a um, missing feature in GitHub, I think where um, if, you, if merging to master basically means it's going to get deployed, then um, that also becomes a bit of a bottleneck. So the workflow that we actually use is um, we have a browser um, extension that adds, injects this button here into the GitHub UI, and people don't actually merge the, their PRs. They just say this is ready to be merged, and then later a bot comes and merges it for you when some heuristic decides that now is a good time to, to deploy this. Um, so this means people can say, okay, this is ready, and then they can move on and work on the next PR and don't have to, basically the, the developers, the humans themselves, they don't have to um, orchestrate this um, whole de deploy process, but it's another step that, um, that we automated. Okay, so the, the next problem I wanna talk about is um, where the name of my um, title comes from, for the, the, the presentation title. And the, the problem is basically that, um, how do you deal with deprecations? So especially if you work on a very low level, like a, a, a team like the one I'm working on, where you do a lot of framework um, changes, a lot of stuff that affects not only a certain feature, but the entire application, then you often, or for example, the team that is responsible for upgrading to a new Rails version and that kind of stuff. So. Um, basically, if you, if you have an API, an internal API that is being used by a lot of code, and your job is to migrate um, from, the, uh, from the old way to do it to the new one. So the, the way that Rails um, solves this internally is with um, active support uh, deprecation notices, and uh, that's basically logging, and everybody gets spammed with this log output, and um, you just have to hope that people will fix it but the reality is people will not fix it because nobody feels responsible for those errors if you have 800, 800 people working on the application. Um, so basically the, the idea is you go and fix all of those methods to use the new one and now everything is fixed. But the problem is that in the meantime, while you did that, someone else might have added a new, um, a new class that also does it wrong or someone, if you do B first and then you do C, after you finish C, someone might have unfixed B and did it wrong again. And uh, it's really, it gets really annoying if you have a lot of people and you try to make l very low level changes, you step on each toes all the time. So um, what else can you do uh, that is better than logging? Um, 
So you can try to send an email and say, hey, don't do this, or you can send a Slack announcement, basically tell everyone, use the new method, not the old one. And that might work if you have five people in, people in your team, but if you have 800 and um, new people get hired all the time and the old people forget it or maybe they don't care or for all kinds of reasons this doesn't really work. So um, the idea is that, the idea that we had is we, we need to find a way to automate this. We need to find a way to educate people what is the right behavior and do this education by, by code, by enforcing certain rules but without pissing everyone off and without everyone having to come to us and ask for help. So the, um, the, the other extreme that you can do is you can, you can basically race in the old method and say this, you can't use this anymore, then you run your tests, fix all the tests, and then you know everything is good. But if you run hundreds of thousands of tests and you have a lot of code, then you can't really, um, you're basically forced to make all those changes in one PR. Um, and if you ship 100 PRs every day, then this is definitely going to cause merge conflict and all that kind of stuff. So you want to find a way to fix those things one after the other, ideally in like tiny slices, one PR per change or, so, or something like that, um, but without people being able to undo your work. Uh, so the idea is basically, if we have two classes that both do it wrong, B and C, can we, say, can we fix B? Um, so that if someone, basi yeah, basically, um, can we whitelist some of those um, users without allowing people to add new ones? And that, that is an idea that we jokingly internally call the shit list. So a shit list is basically a list of things that is already shitty. So stuff that is doing it wrong, and that's basically a whitelist. All of those people are allowed to do it wrong, but you can't add new stuff to it. So for a second, just assume here, that the uh, deprecated method knows who called it. That's, that's one of the um, important ideas. Um, and if, if, if that method knows who called it, you can do something like this, where you say, um, if the caller is either B or C, then those two are okay, because they, they have been around forever and we are working on those, but nobody can add new ones. And now you can go and you can fix C, remove it from the shit list, and now this one is still allowed um, this one is fixed and nobody can accidentally unfix it and also nobody can add new stuff. Yeah. So the problem with this approach is a little bit that um, I, I kind of assumed that I was able to change the method that I want to deprecate but that method might be in a gem or it might be in Rails or it might be you know, somewhere that's outside of your control or maybe you don't want to go through all of those classes and change the um, parameters everywhere. So um, and maybe, maybe the level of granularity that you want to, um, maybe instead of saying uh, B and C are allowed to call this, maybe you want to say the shop model and the customer model are allowed to call this, but not the checkout model. Or you want to say maybe the internal web requests are allowed, but not the external ones. Or maybe the um, background jobs are allowed to do it, but not the web requests. So there's different granularities that you might want. And basically the, the key to how do you implement this granularity is how do you um, uh, how do you figure out who called it so um, and something simple that you can do is you can you can come up with um, with an annotation basically if you look at the bottom we have a, a controller or a, and a job and those jobs basically um, register themselves to the shit list basically with a um, what I call context here so it says um, the context that the code is now running in is the shitty controller foo method or the shitty job. Um, and then the, the shit list itself can say this is allowed, uh, this, this should raise an exception unless it's coming from the shitty job. And then basically the, the workflow is first your, your whitelist, your allowed constant here is empty. You run your tests, you put everything in there that fails the test. That's one PR that you can ship, and now you're confident that nobody can add any, accidentally add any new shit. And then um, your task is now basically remove one item from this list, see which tests fail, fix all of them, and move on to the next one. And this is really great for, um, um, for uh, generating to-do lists, or basically um, giving your team um, a, pro a progress indicator, because you can, you can see how this list is getting smaller and smaller every day. It's super awesome for motivation because people feel like they're making progress, the list is getting smaller, 
and it's much more measurable than um, a log full of deprecation spam that nobody's going to look at. Yeah, so, um, yeah, I think I said that. So to, summary, to summarize, um, this is, in, in our experience, very valuable if you need to change very broad behavior, if you're maintaining some kind of internal API, if you need to break down a huge task into small chunks, this is, has, for my team, has, has become the, the go-to tool. Um, it's awesome for generating to-do lists, for having a, um, something to just work through, and it's also awesome to edu educate um, your team about how you want them to write code and how you want them to, what kind of methods you want them to use and which kinds of methods you want them to stay away from. And um, this, this education happens at a, um, at a code level, so you don't have to talk to all those humans, but you just make good error messages, and um, the error message should then explain what, what, do you, um, what do you want from people. So as an example, um, if you have some certain behavior that you want to deprecate, um, the error message should explain what are you doing wrong, why is it wrong, um, it was working yesterday, like, why is it now wrong, how can I fix it, who can I talk to if I, if I don't know how to fix it. And um, basically the, an error message like this, um, via code, it, in, it enforces good best practices for whatever it is that you want to, um, um, that you want people to do. Okay, so the, the third problem that I want to talk about is the problem of unreliable tests. Um, so this, this one might not be such a big deal if you are working more like a, a service-oriented architecture, but if you're on, working on a monolithic Rails application, then this can get really, really annoying really quickly. Um, so the interesting thing is that there's a, there's a, I mean, most people probably know what the, what the problem is with those, when I say unreliable, uh, unreliable tests, but um, they're not annoying enough to really force you to do something about it, but if, if um, the more tests you have, the more people you have, and so on, those problems become really um, not just likely, but actually common. So if I say, when I say unreliable test, I mean, um, I mean a test that sometimes passes, sometimes fails, without you making any changes to the code. And um, for some context, um, we run about 750 CI builds per day. Um, that's 10 minutes each and about 70,000 tests. And if only a single one of those 70,000 tests is unreliable and fails 1% of the time randomly, then we lose over one hour of productivity per day. And this is the, the, those numbers are based on the assumption that um, those tests are running on your branch, so that's one hour of productivity for one person. If you apply this to master, where a failing test affects way more people, then this is even worse. So um, there's two common types of unreliable tests that I want to talk about. Um, one is the flaky test, so that's the, um, the one that is easy to spot, easy to debug. It's just a test that you, you see all the time. Sometimes it fails, sometimes it doesn't. Um, often that is time dependent, so maybe um, you have like a couple lines in your code and if there's more than a second in between, some timestamp calculation doesn't match anymore or maybe the test only fails if your CI system is under load because something is out of memory or all that kind of stuff. And the second category is way more um, sneaky because the test that is the problem is actually not the one that is failing. Um, so those tests are order dependent. So you might have a test A that fails only if, uh, sorry, a test B that fails only if test A ran before. Um, and um, yeah, tracking down those tests and uh, fixing them is gonna be uh, super important because um, yeah, that can be a huge productivity killer for, um, for your team. So how do you track them down? Um, so a lot of people probably know about um, uh, software like Bugsnag, which is um, an exception tracking software that a lot of people use in production. So every time there happens an exception in your production system, you lock that exception somewhere and you get like data analysis features and all kinds of stuff. Um, I thought this was a really cool um, and interesting idea um, to um, not only use this in production, but only use it for your tests. So every time a test fails in our CI system, we actually report that as an exception. And then we can, we can use all of those anal data analysis features on those test failures. And you get all kinds of cool stuff where you can see when did the st test start failing, um, which PR might have caused it, or um, you even get like um, alerting. You can say if a certain test fails more than 
five days in a row or something like that. You can notify someone or ping the author automatically and that kind of stuff. So um, as for most prob uh, problems, the, the very first step here to fixing the problem is that you need the visibility first. So you need, you need to figure out what is actually wrong, how, how bad is it, how often does it happen, how many people are affected, and so on. Um, yeah, so after you've identified which tests are problematic, um, how do we fix them? So with the, um, the first kind, the flaky test, um, that's the test that sometimes fails and sometimes passes. If you have a suspicion that this test might be flaky, um, obviously you want to you wanna confirm if that's actually the case. So you, what we do is we have a little script on, um, that runs on our CI system, and those little green and red boxes here, um, each box is one container that we run in parallel. Each container runs that one single test in isolation a thousand times, so here we basically run the, th the same test um, 64,000 times. If it's, and if it looks like this, it basically means sometimes it fails, sometimes it passes, and you have confirmation that oh, this test is actually a problem. Um, the other one that it's uh, a little bit sneakier, a little bit harder to debug is the leaky test. So um, if, you, um, if you're not super familiar with um, how testing frameworks like mini, mini tests or aspect work, um, I found this a bit confusing at first when I was um, first learning about uh, test-driven development is that um, it doesn't actually create a new process for each test, but it runs multiple tests in the same process. And that means if those tests um, by mistake somehow mutate global state, those, that, that mutation is still visible in the next test. So it's possible that those tests affect each other. And a leaky test is a test that makes another test fail by modifying global state. And um, a really great way to find those tests is um, using binary search. So what you do is basically you, you look in your, into your monitoring that I had before, and you look at the list of tests that ran, and the last one is going to be the one that failed. Um, but as I said, the, the one that failed is not actually the problem. The, the problem is one of the tests that ran before it, because one of those caused the last one to fail. So you take that list, and you divide it by half. You run the first half, and then the, the failing test. And um, if it fails again, you know the problematic test needs to be in that half. If it doesn't fail, it needs to be in the second half. And then you repeat this and um, repeatedly cut through the list and basically perform a binary search through the list of candidates. And then the tool that we have at the very end says, um, if it does identify a leaking test, then uh, it says, this is how you can reproduce it locally. Here's your leaky test and the test that fails because of the leaky test. And then, um, yeah, you can basically uh, track it down this way. So putting all those pieces together, what we do is, um, we have this automatic monitoring. If a test fails too often or for too many days in a row, you can um, automatically confirm, is it leaky, is it flaky, uh, um, ping the author of the test, say, hey, this is a problem, you should fix it. Um, and this is super valuable for, um, for productivity. Okay, so a uh, quick summary at the end. Um, I talked about three problems. Um, the first one is deploys. So if your application gets really big and if you have a lot of people and you want to ship a lot of code, the, one of the really important things you can do is um, make sure your deploys are really fast because if they are fast, you can deploy more often and you can deploy smaller, which is safer. And um, yeah, so besides making them fast, also automate them, make sure there's as little human involvement as possible. Um, Problem two that I talked about was um, what I call too many cooks in the kitchen. So you have too many people trying to um, change the same thing or stepping on each other's toes or accidentally undoing each other's work and so on. And um, what uh, I would like you to encourage is try this approach of shitless driven development, which is basically um, a fancier version of deprecation warnings where you know once you fix one warning, it's impossible to add new ones or unfix that one. Um, and the last one that I talked about, unreliable, unreliable tests. The important thing that I want you to take away from this is that um, you can actually use a lot of your production monitoring tools for your tests and that you can get a lot of insight out of that. And um, um, using the binary search um, um, approach to find leaky tests is really, um, really powerful. Yeah.
Okay, um, so we're short on time, so we'll just take exactly two questions. Okay, so yeah, here we go. I'm really glad I was sitting close to you. Um, so my question is, um, I've seen a lot of really powerful internal tools here, and some of them, I think the underlying philosophies are applicable about across code bases, but the, the specific tools might not be. So I'd love to talk you to talk about uh, Shopify's decision-making process for what is important to build here. You know, you mean uh, which important tools are important? To uh, like, like important yeah, which which internal tools are important to build? How that how you can make internal tools that fit with the grain of your process effectively? Um, that's a good question. I would say the ones that affect the most people, the, the, the ones that have the most impact across the company are probably the most important ones. So um, for us, the, the test stuff that I talked about was um, as, as more often as you, the, the, the more often you want to deploy, the more annoying it gets if there's unreliable tests. So that was one where we thought, oh shit, this is affecting 500 people. And if, this is, if, it's, if there's too many flaky tests, then there's 500 people who can't get any work done. So that was a good candidate for something that um, we needed to work on. Um, I don't know, does that answer the question? Yeah, thank okay. you. Okay. okay, great. Let's try and get someone from the other side of the audience. <laughs> okay. Um, hi. So first of all, it's a very interesting talk, and um, I have a question on the subject of unstable tests um, because I've also had my share of you know uh, tests that suddenly break one day. So can you share your experience on you know the most annoying and difficult unstable tests that you fix, and how did you fix them? Um, in my experience, the, the flaky tests are usually pretty easy to, to identify and usually pretty easy to fix as well. The, the really annoying ones are the leaky ones where the test that is failing is actually not the test that is the problem. Um, and stuff that I've seen a lot is, um, so, so often the problem is caused by state that is being modified in one test and then some other test somehow is affected by that. And, um, Something that I see a lot is um, stuff related to caching. So someone was trying s to be smart and cached something in like a global variable, or often like um, related to Rails auto loading, where um, the first test caused a certain class or a certain constant to be auto loaded, and then the second test behaved differently because of that. That is often really annoying. Um, there's a lot of very um, um, annoying details about um, how um, transactional fixtures, for example, work in Rails. Like the um, one thing that, that a lot of people seem to run into at Shopify is that if, um, if your test makes a table modification, like an alter table statement to um, add a column, for example, those statements, for example, actually cause a database commit, which means the test does not correctly roll back the changes. And all, like th those kinds of really intricate details that most people don't know about and they shouldn't need to know about it, but they affect your tests. Like th those are, in my experience, really annoying. Thank you. All right, cool. Thank you very much, Florian.